last time on the Back to the Future Retrospective. Thank you so much for watching my review and retrospective of Back to the Future Part 2. Stay tuned for Part 3 and oh look, is that Kurt Cameron? <laughs> Hi, I'm Kirk Cameron, your host for the Secrets of the Back to the Future Trilogy. Yes, everyone, this is Kirk. Hey, I saved Christmas, guys. I really did. Cameron, in the months leading up to the release of Back to the Future Part 3, the hype machine was in full gear. The video that I played right there and then was from a television special called The Secrets of the Back to the Future Trilogy. It was released in April of 1990, before the release of Back to the Future Part 3. And what's notable about this particular release of a special is that this was one, this was the only special for Back to the Future that had been put on tape. This one right here is the Secrets of the Back to the Future trilogy. This was bundled with the Back to the Future trilogy VHS set. I don't have the full set, but I just have this. It comes with this, like, green labeled sort of thing back in the day in the 1980s and 90s or whatever before the age of dvds and blu-rays for special features they would actually televise something like what you just saw on the making of certain movies and in fact before back to the future 3 and back to the future 2 leslie nielsen did a whole thing with the making of back to the future part 2 and also teased back to the future part 3 but that in of itself wasn't the only instance of Back to the Future on television. Also in April of 1990, Back to the Future had a guest spot in an Earth Day special, which we will get back to in part 4 of this retrospective when we talk about the TV show. The real main reason for these pieces of televised marketing, as it were, was that, well, at the same time as Back to the Future 2 was in theaters, Back to the Future 3 was in production, almost about to hit the editing bay, and because of the lower numbers of Back to the Future 2 compared to Back to the Future 1, they needed all hands on deck, mostly because, well, as Bob Gale says, they mismarketed the film. And as I said in the previous video, yeah, it was. They didn't tease this two-part film as part of a trilogy. They expected this, the last film, to be a standalone film and not one that would continue on into a third film. And that's where we are today. As the hype train continued, work was being done on Back to the Future Part 3, and as mentioned in the last video, as Part 2 was being edited, Part 3 was being filmed. And compared to the history of, and compared to the history of Part 2, Part 3's history was a little bit more laid back. Like, yeah, in the background of everything that was happening at Universal and all that stuff, you have all these lawsuits, especially from Crispin Glover and the stunt woman and all this other stuff. But at the same time, the actual production process of Part 3 was a little bit more laid back. Mostly because it didn't involve having to go back to the Hill Valley set all the time and having to change it multiple times. It wasn't as complicated of a move. It wasn't as complicated of a movie as it once was, and you only had maybe one set for Hill Valley. And speaking of that set, Monument Valley was scouted for the 1885 incarnation of Hill Valley, and an entire town was built. We built everything on site. There was nothing done in the West that was not a part of that town. So all the interiors that you see are interiors with exteriors so it after a very short time felt like a real town and then parts we didn't even finish because that was part of the look of the movie the crew also built an area for them to play around and relax when filming was done for the day this made for a much better filming experience as it wasn't as stressful and they also didn't just build a full town in the middle of the desert either they also built in a drive-in movie theater excluding, you know, the projectors and whatnot. And what's really awesome about this is that there's this mural that's by the screen. When someone says, I want this to be like a John Ford movie, they don't usually say, I want you to actually go into Monument Valley and shoot. Then let's say they say they want you to shoot, that's great. But to build a drive-in theater in Monument Valley 
where you see the buttes that are actually reflected in the big mural, which has all the Indians charging, and then send the DeLorean straight at it so that when it hits 88 miles per hour, that will all disappear. And of course, come right into an Indian charge. Back to the Future Part 3 is the film to just sit back and watch. It is a fairly laid back film and doesn't have a lot of huge stakes. It goes to a small, more personal scale of conflict. Instead of Hill Valley being at stake, this time it is just a personal final hurrah for Doc and Marty's journey. When the film gets to 1885, the pace takes a backseat to envelop the audience in the John Ford western style atmosphere. A couple of fun bits of trivia here. Ronald Reagan, who is best known for saying this in conjunction to the Back to the Future franchise. Never has there been a more exciting time to be alive. A time of rousing wonder and heroic achievement. As they said in the film, Back to the Future, where we're going, we don't need roads. Was actually approached to play the mayor of Hill Valley, the first mayor. But he actually declined because, well... He just declined. <laughs> with this, we get to Doc Brown, who in this film falls in love with Clara Clayton, played by Mary Steenbridges. Both Christopher and Mary had worked together on a previous project, and Mary jumped on board to be on this film. This was actually a good thing because if she didn't, Zemeckis and Gale didn't really have another choice. My kids had really been fans of the original film and turned me on to it. I really loved it. I loved the magic of it. And having done a time travel movie, my second film, Time After Time, was a time travel movie. So I already loved the genre. We didn't have a second choice. We didn't know who to go to if she said no. And the three of us were thinking, God, please let her say yes, please let her say yes, because if she says no, what do we do? I remember Stephen telling me that they were very nervous that I would say no. I don't recall ever contemplating saying no, so I don't know what they were so nervous about. I was excited to work with all of them, but it's funny and I guess a little flattering that they thought they had to woo me. <laughs> and Chris Lloyd had been in my first film, Going South, so I already loved Chris. It wasn't a long walk to pretend like I adored him. The Doc and Claire relationship in this film is actually one of the highlights of this film. It could have easily have been a stereotypical, hey, we just love each other because we love each other and just make it the most boring and generic thing, but there was actually a lot of thought put into it. Like, if there was a counterpart to Doc, who would actually match that? Well, maybe it's a school teacher who actually has the same interests as Doc Brown, you know, the same interest in science fiction like Jules Verne and Journey to the Center of the Earth or even astronomy or science. Like, that's the cutest fucking thing in the world. And it was one of those things that kind of predated nerd type relationships in media. And it's actually kind of adorable. Damn it. I read that book too. You, you're quoting Jules Verne from the Earth to the Moon. You've read Jules Verne. I adore Jules Verne. So do I. 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, my absolute favorite. The first time I read that when I was a little boy, why I wanted to meet <laughs> Captain Nemo. And this relationship actually changes the dynamic of the Doc and Marty relationship to me, where in the first film, Doc was more of a brainy character and Marty uses his emotions more. Here, it kind of gets flipped on its head, where Doc needs convincing from his emotions to leave Clara behind, and Marty is very focused on getting back to his own time. You're a scientist. So you tell me, what's the right thing to do up here? As far as Marty is concerned, his arc actually concludes in this particular film when he actually has to take the place of Doc Brown to, well, have the shootouts that would have killed Doc Brown, even though, yes, Doc Brown got shot in the back. I know, I know. But here, this is where we actually get a full roundup of his character arc that would have been part of the two-part film 
or at least into the big one three-hour film that Bob Gale had wrote in the first place. You had him, Mr. Estwood. You could have just walked away and nobody would have talked to Leslie for it. All it would have been was words, hot air from a buffoon. Instead, you let him roil you. Roil you into playing his game, his way, boy, his rules. Seamus, relax. I know what I'm doing. He reminds me of poor Mark. Hi. Who? Me brother. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You have a brother named Martin McFly? Had a brother. Martin used to let men provoke him into fighting. He was concerned that people would think him a coward if he refused. That's how he got a bowie knife shoved through his belly in a saloon in Virginia City. Never considered the future, poor Martin, God rest his soul. Essentially, what this informs us is that Marty's belief before being to get into a fight with everyone and anyone that calls him names or tries to belittle him is a huge flaw, as those who don't wisely choose their battles in fighting for what you believe in are doomed to be in danger. Later on, this actually pays off. Marty ends his arc by refusing the race that would have gotten his hands injured, turning him into the older Marty we saw in part two. Did you do that on purpose? Yeah, you think I'm stupid enough to race that asshole? Jeez. I would have hit that Rolls Royce. And one of the highlights of the film for me, for Marty as a character, is actually the showdown with Mad Dog Tannen, especially this line. If you don't go out there... What? Fine! What if I don't go out there? You're a coward. Six! And you'll be branded a coward for the rest of your days. Everybody everywhere will say Clint Eastwood is the biggest yellow belly in the West. I find this line both hilarious and fun to ponder about. Like, the Marty's name in this is Clint Eastwood, and he's modeled right now after Clint Eastwood, even down to the costume design inspired by Fistful of Dollars. So, I kind of gotta wonder, how did, how did the great Clint Eastwood actually feel about that line? How, like, seriously, how did he feel about it? Was he pissed? Was he angry? Did he actually laugh? I don't know. It's kind of interesting to think about. But after Marty's big epiphany about not giving a care in the world to what other people think of him, he takes down Tannen via recurring gag and is off to rob a train. It's a science experiment! Okay, I get it. It's a science experiment. I get it. Just shut up. The climax of this film is pure tension writing. As simple as it is when you look at its structure, you can't deny that it isn't entertaining. The structure itself is compared to a video game or the rule of threes. It works as simple as this. You have the first stage, which kind of goes a little bit easy. You have the second stage that gets progressively more difficult. And the third stage is, damn, the train is on fire. You're all going to die. Get the fuck out of here. The train they used in this sequence was an actual train, but the only thing with this train is that it was from 1891. But nonetheless, this set piece is still an iconic moment of the trilogy, even if it isn't the best iconic moment. And it is here we finally get to the final moments of the entire trilogy. They finally go to the final resting place of the DeLorean that had been destroyed in 1985. And it seems here that it would be over. Until a train shows up out of nowhere. This thing is actually a really cool looking train. I love this design. It's very much, in, it, it, it just screams Doc Brown. It's very much inspired by like Jules Verne and the novel, Nautilus from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. With all the bells and whistles, the little energy particles spewing off of it. The design itself looks so cool. And I wish there was a Lego set for it. But there isn't, unfortunately. I also love how the kids that Doc and Clara actually have are being named Jules and Vern, as corny as that is. But this ending actually serves a larger purpose. The main thesis of Part 2 and Part 3 is essentially a reaction to Part 1. Our obsession with the future and time travel could lead us down a good or bad path. We can think all the time about the past since it has already been written, but the final scene in part 3 especially perfectly caps the thesis 
that this two-part film clearly was going for. If we were given the opportunity to see the future, we would endlessly obsess about the future and try to find ways to prevent or preserve it. But that now iconic line... I brought this note back from the future and now it's a race. Of course it's a race! But what does that mean? It means your future hasn't been written yet. No one's has. Your future is whatever you make it. So make it a good one. Both of you. Brings a sense of optimism here once again to the trilogy. And ul the ultimate thesis that this trilogy brings to the time travel genre in science fiction is to not worry about what happens in the future and to embrace each day as they come. And this is why I love this film. We do not need a fourth Back to the Future movie. We certainly don't. I get it. This franchise has been mostly about optimism, looking at the brighter sides of life, and standing up for yourself, fighting for injustices, whatever. But the thing is, is that we don't need it. There are plenty of other various pieces of media that have been able to fill our lives that have the same message, and most of us just don't care about that kind of stuff anymore. Or at least movie studios don't care about that anymore. I'm glad that Bob Gale and Robert Zemeckis have gone on to say they will never make a fourth Back to the Future movie. Even with things like the Telltale Back to the Future game or the IDW comics. I'm glad that they're not making a fourth movie. Even as tempting as it would seem, the idea of having to see an older a very much older version of Doc Brown and Marty, especially with Michael J. Fox's condition, I don't know. It just wouldn't seem like a very fun time at all. And to preserve it right here at the very end of the trilogy actually makes for a more wholesome experience. And yes, certainly you can have your expanded lore that is official by Bob Gale's standards at least, or unofficial, because he helped write it. But at the same time, we don't need a fourth movie. That's just all I'm going to say. The film came out Memorial Day weekend of 1990 to even less money at the box office. Even with an aggressive marketing campaign, with a lot of television exposure, they couldn't do it. And again, don't get this twisted. It obviously made a lot of money, but just in comparison to the other two, it was a little bit of a disappointment. But at the end of the day, whether or not we do get a continuation of this beloved franchise, we will always have the original trilogy. And that is something I say with pretty much every single franchise that either will will be rebooted, or will, will be remade, or will get a sequel that somehow retroactively retcons the franchise's past mistakes, and shit happens. And we'll always have the same classic characters that we can watch again and again on physical media. We can watch it again and again with our friends, our family, and really take in the fun of Back to the Future, the trilogy. For me, I really love Back to the Future 3 versus Back to the Future Part 2. It's more focused, it's more streamlined, and it brings a lot more of the emotions into it as a final film. And it just works for me personally. I know there's some people out there that like Back to the Future Part 2 over Back to the Future Part 3, and that's fair. I'm going to give Back to the Future Part 3 a B plus. And that would have been the end of the franchise at that point in 1990, if it wasn't for the TV show. Join me next time in this retrospective series as we talk about the 90s, what it did, and what we should probably forget. <laughs>